All right. We're going to try and bring this to a close with this last part. Um, as we think about, one of the things that we've, we've learned is, and, I, and you'll, you'll see, you heard it a little bit there, is you know, you've got to help people identify what rhythms of life they would engage in if they're going to actually be in people's lives. And um, I want to talk to you those rhythms, but I, want, I just want to share with you maybe a process you can think about. We, we try to encourage our mission communities once a year to engage in what we call um, just basically forming a mission community covenant. And what they do is they, they basically take what I've shared with you so far, like our identity of family, our identity of missionary, our identity of servant, and they, they kind of just begin to run it through this grid um, <coughs> where they say, okay, this next year, if we're going to love one another like family, what would that look like in everyday rhythms of life? Um, in how we eat and celebrate and these things. And, and I want to walk through those rhythms in just a sec with you, but um, it's amazing what people come up with. Like, they're actually quite good at coming up with a plan if you give them the opportunity and you don't try to dictate it for them. So I, I remember um, we were having this conversation and we were kind of talking about all three of these, and I found that it's actually helpful to, to spend, like, okay, we're going to do a and it can be like a four-week process where we go, let's spend a week reminding ourselves of what we believe about the gospel. Then we're going to spend a week reminding ourselves about who we are in Christ as his children and family. And let's talk about how we would then live that out in everyday life. Okay? So, and I, I like to have someone scribe, like, okay, who's going to be taking notes? We'll have someone on the computer and say, okay, let's just talk about the things that we do if we were going to love one another like a family. And, you know, stuff comes up like, Oh, we would, we would eat regularly together. I remember one year we were doing this, and someone said, it seems like family eats together. Why don't we eat together three times a week? Someone else said, that's a lot. We're not going to be able to pull everybody together three times a week. And someone else said, well, what if we just commit to three kinds of meals a week? One of them is everybody together once a week. Big family meal. Okay. How about and someone else said, what, then what about another meal that's like just with some people in the group? Could be a couple guys getting together for a coffee or a beer, or could be a couple going out on a double day, whatever, but another time we'll just get together with some people group. Okay? You're already gonna eat 21 meals, do a few of them together. Uh, and then the third one was let's be really intentional to have a meal with some people who don't know Jesus and that are part of our mission that we're trying to reach out to once a week. So I just said three meals once a week. Alright? Uh, then and we aren't legalistic. It's like, you know, we know that we're all not going to do that perfectly, and that's okay. I remember when we first started doing this, people were like, man, I don't know if we want to do this, because if we say something and we don't do it, then what's going to happen? That's called grace. I got married. I said I would, you know, be faithful to my bride until death do us part. I haven't been. You know, I mean, I haven't cheated on her, just so it's clear. But, but like, <laughs> there are days when I love myself more than her. There are days when I have thoughts I shouldn't have about other people. I mean, that, that's real. So I say, forget it, I'm not going to get married. There's no way I can uphold that covenant. No, I get married because God is faithful to keep his covenant even when I'm not. And he's faithful to forgive me and be gracious to me even when I fail. And so I make a covenant knowing that I have a covenant keeper in him that can even help me in my failures. That's a beautiful thing. So don't fail to, to, make, to make some distinctions about what you think God's calling you to do because you know you're going to fail. Don't do that. You know, it's like, I, I want to say that I'm going to commit to prayer every day. I probably won't. So do you just not pray? Or do you say, God's gracious and loves me even when I fail? So I encourage you to press forward in these things because it helps people to really, one, understand grace, to know that they're going to fail, but two, to actually have a plan of what they're going to do. So they put something tangible down. So uh, we've had people say, like, okay, um, how about if we, we help make sure every couple that's here that has kids gets to have at least one date night a month and we'll all provide child care. We'll, we'll watch their kids. It'd be great. Uh, let's do a vacation together once a year. Great. Who's going to take charge of that? Clay. Great. You love to do that? Help us with that. And, and we just kept going. You're like, well, what, what kinds of things did we do? And let's do, let, let's, let's make sure that um, we always know the needs that any of us have and we're willing to take care of each other's needs when, we, when they come up. Let's not be afraid to tell each other our needs. Um, how about if we make sure we pray for one another? And uh, why don't we use like an a, a app on the phone that will let people know that whenever they need prayer, they can send an app, they can send a text out, it goes to everybody, we use GroupMe, um, and then everybody knows time to pray for people. And we just started walking through what would family do. And one of them on there was, we should really know each other's stories. If we don't know each other, how are we going to love each other? So then they said, well, how are we going to know each other's stories? Well, why don't we do a story a week for the next few months so that we all know each other? Great. Then someone asked, what if someone new joins us? 
we have to do all of our stories over again? <laughs> said no. And so and so, why don't we do this? If someone new joins us, we'll hear their story, and then it's our job to have each one of them over for dinner over the next couple of months, so we'll have a meal with them, and we'll share our story with them. Oh, great. Okay, so we just started thinking through, and what's really amazing is like you end up going, this is going to be a great year. We're going to love one another like a family. We're going to learn a lot. We're going to serve each other. We're going to watch each other's kids. We're going to go on a vacation together. We're gonna, this is good. And it's not that hard. You know, it's the stuff that you want to do anyway. Um, and then, then it was like, okay, well, how should we be servants? How are we going to show the kingdom of God breaking into this world? And I remember we got to this particular one. And um, we had, some of you know that we've been working on that community garden at Nikki's backyard. And Alyssa and Ian were a new couple that joined our group. And Ian was a, had dreads. And he, he reminds me, he was kind of like a Rastafarian Northwestern eco guy. You know, he's like all about the environment. He was studying to do environmental uh, work. He had long dreads. He's a really cool guy. I love him. But he's, he's a very fun Northwestern guy. Not following Jesus. Alyssa um, had, was a, a believer, but had, they both they had been a part of a church. And they started coming to our, our, we did a cookout in our backyard all summer long. We, it's pretty normal, we just don't put, put a fire out, kids do some wars. I love it because a lot of the guys will hang out late and smoke cigars together and all that. And you know, It's amazing what will happen when you get a bunch of guys out together late at night and they stay together long enough, they start talking. So he'd come to that and start getting to know us. But, and that, that led into our fall where they joined us and then it led into our covenant process that we were going through that Ian was hardly ever a part of, but Alyssa was there. And so she's in this conversation, where we're talking about servanthood, and we're talking about what does that mean to be servants of Christ, and how do we show the kingdom of God breaking in this world? And there are a lot of things. There was the backpack stuff talk, helping the kids at the school, tons of things. But one of them that came up was, who's going to take charge of the community garden? And Alyssa said, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. And it was like, all right, Alyssa, why don't you lead us in that this year? She said, but I can't. I'm too busy. I don't have the time. We're like, wait a minute, you said you feel like you're called to do that. Yeah, I am. I think I am. But I can't. But why not? And uh, she's, by the way, every time, whenever I'm in this pro, I love this covenanting process because every single time I go through it, people have reasons why they can't be involved or things that they're afraid of or stuff they won't do. And I always say that's the opportunity because that's the gospel flag being waved. Like, I need someone to preach Jesus to me, you know, or I need this community to help me. And so that was her, she was really doing that. Because she knew she felt called to something, but she didn't know how she could do it. And uh, at that point, I remember asking, um, well, what, why can't you? And she said, well, you know, Ian's going to school full time. He's working a job. I'm working a job. We have two kids. I don't have any time. And one of our guys asked, well, what if you didn't have to work? What if you were freed up from that? She's like, well, how would that happen? She's like, well, how much do you make? And she was pretty new to our community, and she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he said, well, we're just being family. This is what family does. When you feel like you're called to do something, but you can't, we want to find out why so we can help you. And she said, well, I'd make, I, I need to come up with another 500 a month. And um, everybody pretty quickly said, well, I think we could all come up with that. How about if we just give you 500 a month? And you, of course, you need to talk to your boss and don't just leave them, you know, just abandon them. But you can probably quit your job and we'll cover that until your husband's out of school, which is probably another year and a half to two years. And um, she's like, what are you guys doing? So this is family. She says, I can't accept that. And then one other person said, well, you've expressed faith in Jesus, right? Yeah. Do you believe that you receive the most costly gift there is to receive in Jesus Christ? She said, yeah. And someone said, well, if you can receive him, you can receive this. Because this is nothing compared to Jesus. And she said, if you put it that way. <laughs> and so she did. So we began. We didn't know this. So that morning, she had uh, found out she was pregnant with her third child. And she had asked God to make it possible for her to be a stay-at-home mom. But she had no idea how that was going to happen. So she just started to tear up at that point. Because she realized God had answered her prayer. She went home, got on Facebook, and started telling all her friends what happened. And a bunch of them said, there's got to be a catch. Nobody does this. Why would anybody do this? And she just started sharing the gospel with all her friends as to why people do these kinds of things. It's a great opportunity for her to get in a conversation about Jesus around this conversation of us being servants, leading her to be a uh, love like family. Okay? So we said as family, $500 a month. She said as servant, 
we're going to care for this community garden. That led to us being able to give a ton of food away, having people over. Every time we'd have a cookout, we went over to the garden, got food. It was just a really beautiful picture of God's people together in our area. And so we walked through that. That wasn't the only thing we talked through. There was like, okay, let's let's uh, make sure we, we said let's talk about everything that we have and whatever we have that we can help each other with. Let's make a list. Anybody have needs in our group? Yes, well, let's make sure we take care of each other's needs. And so we began to talk about, do some people need help with bills once in a while? Do other people, you know, don't know how to budget? And we just walked through all the ways we could serve each other. Okay, now what about our school? Where can we serve them? And that's where we said, let's recommit to the auction and helping to lead that so we can raise money for the school and arts education. And, and it just continued that way. And it, it's not that big of a deal. And then we actually talked about Jesus. This is the key. I want to make sure you understand, you cannot say it's missional if you're never going to talk about Jesus Christ. Okay, and, and we, well, I've been having more and more conversations. Tyler was just telling me he's, he's wanting to push us to help people think through. You can't just be acquaintances with people. You've got to move to really getting to know their story and them getting to know your story and then you getting to have a conversation about Jesus Christ at some point to bridge this gap <coughs> of their life to his life. And if, if you don't get there, then it's just us being really nice people. And we have something to give them. You got Jesus. And so you got to talk through how you're going to help your group get to be proclaimers of Jesus at some point. And for us, this has been a great tool using the story of God. Uh, it's 10 weeks, very, very non threatening to unbelievers because we say we're not going to open our Bible. For all the Christians, it shows that you, you find out where they're at on that issue because they're like, what are we going to do? We can't do that. It's like, do you know your Bible? Just listen and engage. And it actually scares Christians a little bit because they're, you know, we're so people of the book because of the Reformation that anytime you say you're not going to open the book, they think that you're denying the book. And it's like, no, no, we're going to talk about the book. We're just going to do it in a way that's actually transferable. Because uh, if you can't go talk to people about Jesus without having to open your Bible every time, then you're probably not going to be very effective. It's got to be in your heart. You've got to have it in your mind. You've got to be ready to give an answer. So... So I've learned that it's really good for Christians to go through it, not just non-believers. And it's especially really good for Christians to go through it with non-Christians in the room because all of a sudden their sensibilities change. They're starting to pay attention to the questions non-believers ask and the way that they struggle you know, with the story. I remember we, we took a group through it, and I referred to Jim earlier, who was really kind of leaning towards Buddhism. And he, uh, when we got through you know, the first story, the Adam and Eve eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil so that they, you know, they would uh, become like God. He said, I don't say anything wrong with that. Like, isn't, isn't awareness, isn't like, aren't we supposed to be like, like come to the knowledge of good and evil? And you know, he started going to a whole, his Eastern uh, religion and started to unpack that with the group. And, and I remember watching our people, they were like, what do we do? What do we do? We don't know how to answer this. Like, is that right? Is that how, is that true? And, uh, and so someone said, wait a minute, let's go back to the story. What did God say? Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So is it good that they ate of it? And Jim, what do you think? According to the story, did God think it was good that they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He said no. According to the story, God said no. Okay, so we're not talking about what we think. We're talking about what God thinks. So we'll stay in that realm through this whole story. You may not agree with that, but we're going to keep going through the story talking about what God thinks about these things. Because we want to, this is his story, not ours. So in that moment, all of a sudden Jim started, we get to form a theology for Jim that you don't get to form God in your image, in your preferences. God gets to tell you who he is, and we submit to that. So that's a huge point for, non, for Christians to go like, how do I engage with a non-Christian? Is it okay to definitively say what God says is true? Absolutely. You have to. If you just came in to what everybody else thinks, you got nothing. So that was a training point for all the Christians in the room. What do we do with Jim? Now, what do we do with a guy who doesn't agree? And they got trained while we went through it. Well, Jim came to faith eventually. I loved it because he would be the guy who'd be like, you can't believe that. That's, that's not even in accordance with what this says. Do you guys read this? You know, and Jim became like a defender of the faith instead of the one who was like questioning everything. So we got to train him through that. So, so you got to have a plan for this part. Help your group think through how they're going to get to conversations about Jesus at some point. This is where most people don't get to. They just go, we're going to love each other really well and do lots of service projects. They never talk about how are we going to eventually get to Jesus. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can say, we're going to go on a retreat. We're going to go on a vacation together. Invite all our friends. And throughout the weekend, we're going to ask them their story. 
as we get to know their story, they're going to tell us, they're going to ask us about our story. And when you tell your story, tell your story making Jesus the hero. That's what we're going to do that weekend. That might be one of your plans. You can cover lots of ways to help your group think through how they're going to talk about Jesus. But you've got to talk about how you're going to help them get there. This is usually the one that gets left out. And then what happens is we're just really nice people who serve. And no one comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So we try to do this formation every year. The beauty of it is every time you do it, people get better at it. Because they go, last year really was a wasted year. We didn't do so well. <laughs> like, that's okay. There's grace for you. Jesus doesn't see any differently. You're still God's children. Okay, how about if we try it again? Can we reform our missional community and reform our covenant and get serious about what we're going to do this next year? And the beauty of that is sometimes people leave the group because they don't want to be a part of it, and that's not bad. I've had people go, I just don't really feel called to this at all. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Can we help you find another one? And then I get to refocus my group. And every year I do that. Now, can you imagine if you get people in your church on a yearly basis making a strategy for making disciples who will make disciples year after year after year? Pretty soon they're going to be really good at this kind of work, and you can go with them and go plant a church someday somewhere else. That's what you want. You want to train them up to own the priority of making disciples who make disciples. Okay? Now, I want to walk through the rhythms. Some of you guys know them, but I just want to, I'm going to do it in a bit of a story. Um, some of you may have heard I'm sorry if that's the case, but it's a really good story that helps you understand it. So before I do that, any questions about the whole covenant forming process? Hey Jeff. Yes. I was talking to Todd about um, having the covenants almost every three or four months because you see yeah. some change. We're actually shifting to that. Like that's the, uh, Randy came up with that. So Randy said, I'm, I'm observing that almost every three months there's a, we need to refocus it for what's coming next. So I'm like, I'll see how that goes. I think it's a great idea. Partly because where we're at, you have like your, your kickoff in the fall. Ten, at least my experience is in the northwest, it's really nice in the summer. And the rest of the year, it's just really not. So, so like you're, if you want to meet a whole bunch of non-believers and get them engaged in the community life, your summer months are the best. And for us, that's, you know, that's June, July, August. And so then what we find is that you get with these new people, and so you have to refocus on what you're going to do with them. For us, my experience has been that's a good time to do the story of God, maybe, if there's non-believers with you. But then you get to the point where some will come to faith, and you're going, now we've got to form them and talk about what we need to study together. So you might look at January, February, March as forming and establishing new disciples. And then you might go, now let's look at how we're going to use our summer again intentionally. So Randy's trying to encourage us to think every in three-month blocks on how we're going to refocus what we do. I think it's a great idea. I don't know that everyone's going to rewrite their covenant every three months, but they might just focus on some unique things. Here's the thing to keep in mind, what I just gave you. Th help your people think seasonally about discipleship. Okay? Think seasonally. And what I mean by that is, if I was working with college students, how would I change that rhythm? It'd be very different, wouldn't it? The summer, we, we, they wouldn't be here. So we would be probably doing leadership development and maybe taking uh, a breather on some of the activity on campus and spending more time with the people that are trying to reach the kids on campus, building each other up, encouraging each other, helping them get ready for the next season. But then when fall hits, at least for us, in August, August, September, all the new students are showing up on campus. We probably should be there welcoming them, you know, bringing uh, welcome packages, you know, helping them set up their dorm rooms, freshman orientation be there, help the freshmen move in, let them know, hey, we're going to be a family to you, so if you ever want a home-cooked meal, we're here. We love to give home-cooked meals to college students who are tired of eating college food. So sign up for them. Here's how you can be a part of a home meal, and they're in our homes, and, you know, you, and then we're going to, you know, then you go, okay, what about finals week, okay, everybody needs like special care packages because they're going nuts, and so you, you let them know they can order pizza and we'll bring it at any time, and we're going to also give you care packages that like have all kinds of snacks and coffee and you name it, and if you need a place to get away from the campus for a few hours to take a break, our homes are open, we'll create study uh, places inside of our house where you can just get away from everybody else, and so you know, start building it, you know, and okay, when they're done with finals week, you know, what they all need a break, let's give them, a, let's take them out to a beach house and just have a lot of fun out in the ocean, you know, we'll let college students know we'll do that for them. And so you build a rhythm in light of their rhythm, in light of their college year. Uh, in my case, it's very different. We're reaching our kids' school, so yeah, we still follow a school calendar, but the summer is when all the parents and kids can stay out late. So we're doing some more house every week. 
because all the kids are hanging out till 10 at night. In the Northwest, it's still sunny till 10 at night, so it's a great time. So I got kids running around my house all summer long. That's a lot of fun, and I try, we try to, to change our rhythm for that. So think seasonally, think rhythmically, think about who you're, help your people think through how they're, who they're trying to reach. You're reaching a bunch of people who work in business. Just remember there's tax, well, I don't know how it is for you guys, but like we have a tax season, and like when that hits, you're not going to expect a whole lot from your people. You know, like they're going to be working late hours, so what do they need? They need maybe after they're done with that, they might need you to start to care for them in different ways. So think through rhythms, think through seasons, think through the, the year that way. Make sense? Yes? Just a quick one, just with your covenants. That's, that's what you just described then, is that a covenant? Top, like you're not, That'd be part of our covenant. Pieces of paper, are they? Well, we like we used to do that more often. Not as many are doing a sign thing because some people like freaked out by that. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny because the artist was like, "We don't want to sign anything." We're like, "Well, do you sign a credit card statement?" Yeah, that's a contract. You realize? How many times you sign that? Three times a day. Okay. You have no problem signing anything. They're like, "Yeah, we just don't want it." Like, you know those paintings you do? Do you put your signature on the bottom of the painting? Yeah. So you're not, if you have a problem with a signature, why don't you guys pick a, a signature form that would be helpful for you? So it's funny, they're all like, we're going to do a painting and we're going to put our fingerprint on it. And it's our sign that we're in. And like, Whatever, I don't really care. Like, I just want you to like, that's why they commit to each other. You know, like, like say, can we look at each other and say yes for this year, we're in. Do whatever that takes. Do it your own cultural way. Do a dance. <laughs> yeah, do a dance. <laughs> As a graphic designer, you built this whole like rhythmic thing on a, on a, it was beautiful actually. I'm like, that's really cool. He goes, that's our covenant. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't know how to read it, but it seems like you guys do. So. <laughs> it was all shapes and designs, and each one meant a different thing. And I'm like, as long as your group knows what it means, that's it. So I think whatever cultural form of saying yes to one another you want to agree in, maybe it's, we're going to have a big meal together around it once we're done, and we're going to break, we're going to make covenant around a meal. I don't know. So I don't know that I'm that concerned about whether they sign a piece of paper. I'm more concerned that they are agreeing together to be this kind of people. What about so cutting up an animal or having some smoke? So, yeah, I think that's a good way to do it. That may be under us if we fail to keep this covenant. I think we should do that. That's a good idea. We're going with that. But the, the, having people really talk about being committed to something, because we live in a, I, I don't know if it's true for you guys, I think it's probably, I think we have similarities culturally. We live in a day and age where people don't want to be held accountable to anything. Yeah. They don't want to, they don't want to commit to one another. And when you commit to one another, you're saying, I love you. You're saying you matter to me. That's like, it's a big deal. Out, <laughs> yeah, that's right. They want something better. They always want an out. <laughs> yeah. So I, why would I ask you, Pete, what if something else came up that I like more than you? Yeah. That's what we're saying. So no. it's good to teach people how to devote themselves to one another and to something for a little bit. You know, it's, it's only nine months to a year. It's not that big of a deal. They can get out of it when they're done. You know, it's, and they can even get out of it in the middle if they have to. It's just getting them to think through Will I commit myself to some people? Do you include grace in that? Absolutely, yeah. yeah like do you say, we're not perfect people? Yes, yeah. That's part of our training is we say, you're going to fail this. Yeah. It's like what I said earlier when I made my covenant to my wife. But I, I think it's a failure thing that people That's why they about. don't do it. And, and then they go, well, now they're asking me to, to, to do this. And then that's right. I can't do it, so why should I say yeah. Well, here's the, here's the brilliance of it. I hope that you saw it. Nobody's giving it to them. They're creating it. So we're not telling them to do anything. We're saying, if you believe you're a family, what, would you, what do you think you should do? And so it's their ideas. Uh, and it's, so, so it's, it's, it's what the, I think the Spirit of God is leading them to if they're following Him. And that's beautiful because it's, it's coming out of their heart. And uh, that's different than us as leaders. And this is why I just warn you. Be careful that you don't impose a, a plan on everybody. Yeah. You, you, you gotta eat this many times together, you gotta play this, you gotta do this, you gotta do like that's that's gonna feel like a new, new legalism. Yeah. Let them work through their how their love for one another gets expressed. And here's what happens, their first year, I guarantee you, it's gonna suck. <laughs> I promise you, like they'll be done like, man, we should be like, why didn't we like not do much for we we wanna be a better family. And they'll actually grow in that. And that's okay. My kids 
their, their first year or so of following Jesus, it's just a mess, you know? And as they grow more in their love for Christ, they grow more in their love for each other. And they get, they're growing up in Christ. And that's okay for people to be at different places. And I, I've even had people who are going through the process uh, say, I don't know if I can commit to all that. Say, that's okay, what can you commit to? Give them grace to go, I'm just not there yet. That's all right. A lot of us would like to do this. Not all of us have to. So if it's because otherwise it feels a bit like communism or something, you know, like some kind of weird uh, like cult. So be careful about that. Give people the freedom to say, "I'm not quite there yet." Okay. Well, what, what where are you at? I think I can at least do this. Great. We'll help you as you work through that. So it allows them to be at their place of life and stage of faith and growth. Because mental so, illness is a big thing now. That's right. So. Some people might feel well at one stage and not well at another. That's right. So Covenant-wise, they might feel a bit Oh, I've got so many people in our group who will not even come close to doing what we say we're going to do. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Can I ask you a question on that? Yeah. Um, so, with the group, is, is like your core friendship in the group, like, like your close friends, are they in your community group? Or? Right now they are. No. Not okay. mine. But that's partly because I send out people all the time. My closest friend is Randy, okay. and he's kind of like a Timothy to me. Yeah. So I love him dearly, but I don't get to see him dearly as much as I used to. Yeah. So we, I poured my life into him, so we periodically say, can we get together again and just yeah. have dinner and celebrate what God's allowed us to do over these last few years? I miss you like crazy, brother, but yeah. for the sake of his, his work, we're willing to be a part. So that, that's hard, by the way. You've got to train people to think differently about relationships. Yeah. You know, like they've got, you almost got to prepare them to grieve loss. Mm -hmm. If they don't actually grieve the loss, they'll never do it again. They'll be like, I'm not doing this anymore. This hurts too much. Mm -hmm. The loving people, building relationships, then saying goodbye. I'm not going to do that ever again. If you say no, the, the, the kingdom calls us to lose at times. But we get to gain because we'll get to be with each other forever. Yeah. So this is a temporary loss, but let them tell them that they're going to have to grieve it. That's one of the biggest learnings I've had through the seasons of these works is you've got to stop and let's say, let's celebrate all the great things God did, and let's be honest about how much it hurts to send people off to see new work get started. Let's really be honest about the grief and grieve that. And let's have reunions and get back together and tell the stories and thank God we get to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And, you know, it's all that stuff. It's like when my kids leave home and get married, it's going to kill me. I know it is. And yet, that's what I'm raising for. So I hope that they'll bring the grandkids to come visit. Right? That's, so it's, it, that familial understanding can help us even. And too. just on that, like, do the groups change every year? Um, every one of them decides whether they want to stay together and be on mission to the same people or whether they need to send some people out to start a new one. It's up to them. Like, my particular mission community will probably always have Nikki with us until she dies. That's the widow who lives next door. It's funny, she told us last time, she goes, I said, what if we move? She goes, you're putting me on the back of a trailer and dragging me down the road. <laughs> I'm going with you. You got me until I die. So, all right, Nikki, you're with us until you die. And I think there's going to be some people who just go, like, we're always going to be together. Yeah. And that's reality. But I think those who are stronger and grow up in Christ and are ready to be sent out, we can't hold them back just for our own sake. Yeah. we got to release them for the sake of the kingdom. Yeah. So that's why letting go of Randy was really hard for me. But it's good for the kingdom. So in your group dynamics, you kind of make sure there's a mixture of strong kind of leaders amongst. I encourage every missional community to get a few apprentices in the in the leadership mix so you're always training up some people and you got some people to share leadership with you. Yeah. I, I think it's dangerous when you have one or like a, just a couple leading the whole thing or one person leading the whole thing because then it's all the weight's gonna fall on you and you wanna show shared leadership as early as possible. And then you go we apprenticing, so I always have one or two or three apprentices around me. And, uh, and I try to grab young emerging leaders to pour into for a season or two. So, and I'd say to all of you who are really strong leaders and good at development, please realize that God's given you to the church to train up as many people as possible. Don't, don't, don't neglect that gift that God's given you as, as a person for the church to equip. I think that may be all of you in the room. I don't know you, but just I think sometimes we're, we're missing out on the opportunity to raise up young leaders because we just stop following them under our, our leadership development track. So pull them under your wing and develop them. So, yeah. All right. I want to tell you a story of my friend. You, know, you guys know who Clay is? Have you heard this story before? So you have, so you have it. <clears throat> we recognized at one point that there were um, 
several key rhythms in life that everybody engages in, and we just asked, is this my or not? We asked, um, what if we help people live the normal everyday rhythms of life with gospel intentionality instead of giving them a whole new program to live? Just have them live what they would do normally in life. So everybody eats. That's normal, right? You guys eat? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, side note, we were talking about this one time. And uh, I was teaching, and a woman came up to me after, and she goes, i got to be honest with you, I'm actually unhealthy. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, you talk about like everybody eats together. Or everybody eats, and if we just start eating together intentionally, we could have a lot of time together around meals. She said, I don't eat. I said, that's not true, you'd be dead. She goes, well, what I mean is I don't ever sit down and eat, I graze. I said, you have to explain what you mean by that. She said, I go through my day, and every once in a while I just eat a snack, but I never ever slow down and ever, I never sit down and have a meal, I never do. I said, that's very unhealthy. And she said, I know. What, what do I do? I said, you of all people need a community. So I said, I want to encourage you to make it a goal to actually sit down and eat a meal with somebody on a regular basis. Um, you probably should at least sit down once a day and eat. But um, <laughs> I was like, I was like, yeah, I mean, this is like crazy. But here's the thing, the reason why I'm saying it is because you will find that a lot of people do not slow down to eat. They don't, they eat on the fly. They drive through something, grab something, they, they, they bring it with them, and they never slow down and sit. And that's dangerous. It's not healthy. Please know that. One, it's not even good for your body to be eating all the time. You'd be moving all the time. You need to slow down all the time. So, eat together. Um, while you're eating, you're listening. <clears throat> listen to the Spirit on behalf of each other. In all of life, listen. Learn how to listen to God speaking. He's speaking all the time to you. I learn how to listen to his word, open it up and listen to what he has to say, learn how to listen to each other. Do you know in North America, I don't know if the, how, what it's like here, over a hundred billion dollars is spent in the United States on counseling. hundred billion a year. Because someone just wants someone to listen. It's amazing. We're supposed to, we have the counselor, the Holy Spirit. Of all people, we should be the best at this. Because he's in us. So learn how to listen. As you're listening, I'm sorry, I might be losing my voice. This is kind of scary. I still have three days to go. <laughs> Lord, keep my voice going. Um, as you're listening, listen to their story. Listen to what shapes them, what's defined them. Everyone has a, a meta narrative that defines their life. It's the overarching story that helps them understand how the world works. Randy, I was telling you earlier, his meta narrative was largely, his view of father was defined by his father, earthly father. Um, most of us, our, earth, our earthly family is what's defined our worldview most. Okay, then probably secondarily, it's the city or context we grew up in. Um, those things do shape us. So we need to get to know each other's stories. We need to get to know God's story. Um, now I want to tell you about Clay, and I'll come back to this in a little bit. Clay um, and I met at a Halloween party. So when we first moved into our neighborhood, we felt like our first mission was our neighborhood. Now it's our school and the neighborhood around it. But it started with our neighborhood. And um, we just said in the summer, we're going to have a, a cookout every Friday night uh, for three months in a row. And we're going to try and invite everybody in the neighborhood. So we went around and knocked on every door. It was me and my two-year-old daughter. It was very cute. And she's 12 now, but <clears throat> she was two then. And, uh, two or three, and we, we walked around, knocked on the door, gave him a flyer, said, we're going to have a party at our house this Friday night. We'd love to have you come. I remember one person when I did that said, you know that we don't do that around here, right? <laughs> I said, well, you're going to now, because we're going to start making it normal. And they were like, yeah, right. So no one showed up hardly. We did it again the next week. Knock, knock, knock on every door, hand him a flyer, come over, we're going to have a party. Okay. A few came. Did it again the next week. I remember one person said, you're not going to give up, are you? I said, no, we're going to do this every Friday night until everyone in our neighborhood has been in our house. So we'll just keep inviting you. And my daughter's like, will you come? You know, like, it's hard to say no to her. And so by the end of the summer, everyone in our neighborhood had been over our house for a cookout. And all of a sudden, and that was in the summer, we uh, then threw a Halloween party. 
And um, one of these things, by the way, is engage in celebration intentionally. Celebrate in the, in the cultural celebrations. Engage in those with people. And maybe bring, bring celebration where it doesn't exist. I remember a mission of community found out that the boys, most of them had never had a birthday party. So they made it their goal that year that every kid would get a birthday party. <laughs> I remember them telling about the very first time they did it. This kid sitting there, he's never had a birthday party in his life. He's like eight years old. And he's just kind of like looking at the cake going, what in the world is that? But that's a cake. It's yours. It's your birthday party. And those pile of presents, you know, and he's blown away. Who's are those? Those are yours. And, and then they went around and they each, each person just blessed the kid. They said something that they saw that they appreciated about him. The mom's in the background just weeping because she could never afford this. And they're just blessed. They did that for every kid on the block. It's a really cool opportunity to just celebrate in such a way um, and, and to really bless people because we've been blessed to be a blessing. And uh, when you think about blessing and celebrate, uh, think about blessing as like God has all given you all something to give to somebody. If you can help your people realize that everything they have is not just for them but for others. I remember we had a group go through this whole idea of blessing and said, Hey, we're going to make a list of everything God's given us, and then we're going to ask why. And so they went through, and like, I mean, they went as far as like bank accounts and checking accounts, and savings, retirement, uh, cars, homes, skills, experiences, you name it. And they make huge lists. And at the end of it, one of the, a few of the people in the group said, well, we don't have much because we're in debt. We've gotten into a lot of credit card debt. And a group of people said, well, we have lots of money. You have lots of debt. So why don't we pay it off? And they just paid off the credit card debt. And then they cut the cards and said, you don't know how to use this. So <laughs> that's how you know how you were going to hold on to that. And, uh, but we're blessed to be a blessing. And then, then you go and say, the people we're trying to reach, what do we have that they need? Guaranteed God's given you what they need. More than you realize. But we just haven't taken account of what he's given us. Israel had everything that the people God called them to love needed. He does the same thing for you. He's given you things that people need. Um, some people need parenting training. Some people need budgeting training. Some people need money. Some people need an extra room. Some people need an extra car. Some people need a break. Some people need someone to watch their kids. There's all kinds of things they might need. You ask that question, how could we be blessed to be a blessing? And uh, and so we're, we're having this, we're having this <coughs> Halloween party and uh, at my house, and we started kind of just creating an environment for this to happen in our neighborhood. I remember uh, people came over. We had a ba baked potato bar. Did you guys do Halloween here? No. Okay. Do you know what it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You do, you, we do. We, we do, do, do it. We do it in the North Shore. Yeah. We do it in the city. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, you got a hot concentration of Americans. Oh, the Americans! <laughs> I love it. That's funny. Uh, so. We, we, we had like baked potato bar, people could come in, put chili on it, and you know, eat. And then, well, I mean, it's amazing because it's one of the only times of the year where people come knocking on your door. So it's, a, it's an easy in. And uh, we had hot cider out on the porch, and you, you know, you get the biggest candy bars you can because then the kids ever tell us, you go to that house, they have all the best candy. And so, so we do these big Halloween parties, and pretty soon, this went on for a year or two. I remember one year, Thank you very much. I remember one year, our neighbors across the street said, you guys always throw the party, can we throw it? Amy and Tully. So they throw the big Halloween party, and we're at their house, and Clay and Christy show up, and they're part of our school. We didn't know them, though. And Amy says, hey, I want you to meet Jeff. He's uh, this pastor I told you about, but he's not like a pastor. That's how she identified me. And, uh, and so we're, we're having fun celebrating, eating, and um, Clay and I take all the kids out trick-or-treating, okay? Because uh, it's rainy, it's a little wet. And so as they're out, I start asking him about his life. I start asking him about his, his upbringing, where he grew up, and what brought him to, the, to our city. And he starts telling me about himself. And he was a bit of a kind of a pot-smoking hippie in college, and he loved surfing. And, and he was kind of like, almost like into this weird, like, it's pretty Northwestern where I live. Is like people are into spiritualism, but it's not anything. You know, it's like they like light and dark and energy. And <clears throat> so, you know, they're like, yeah, I just think there's energy in the world, and I'm just trying to tap into it. And, <laughs> okay. And uh, so I'm listening to a story, and I'm creating a vocabulary. 
What language does, does Clay use that I'm going to use eventually when I tell him about Jesus? So I'm just listening well, hopefully. And um, we have a great time. I started encouraging him to help us out with the community garden because he loves to get his hands dirty. He told me that, so he starts coming and helping with that. And then he calls me and says, hey, my wife and I and the kids are going to go away to the coast for our vacation. You guys want to come with us? Which is really weird where we live because you don't invite people to join you on your vacation if you are like super close friends. So I'm like, this is one of those God moments, you know? And uh, one of these other rhythms that we talk about is recreating. Like engaging in play together, engaging in fun together, engaging in creating beauty together, engaging in playfulness together. Like, um, and I don't have enough time to go into all this, but I'll just tell you, this is one of the things that I'm most concerned about with most Christians. They don't know how to rest. They don't know how to play. They don't know how to have fun. It's like we're so works-oriented, we don't know how to rest. And the writer you know, in Hebrew says, the Israelites failed to enter their rest because of their unbelief. So the question I'd ask for you is, can you rest? Can you go away? And so they said, hey, it's this weekend. Would you be willing to come with us? And I was supposed to preach that week, so I called our leadership and said, do you guys mind if I'm not there? Can someone else step in? And we always said that we're willing to leave the 99 for the 1. Here's an opportunity. Of course, they all were like, yes, get out of here. So <laughs> it's not because I was a bad preacher, I don't think. But, um, so we went, we went away for the weekend with Clay and Christy, and I was about to walk out the door and grab my computer, and I remember the Spirit of God. And I'm thankfully learning how to listen. Say, so do not bring that, because you do not need to be working. You need to go rest and play. So we went and hanging out at the beach. Clay goes out surfing. He was he was terrible. I think he's a good surfer, but the he was this horrible surf out of the northwest. You don't get the best out of the ocean there. And uh, he almost drowned. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's not gonna make it. And he, <laughs> he comes in and we're talking about it. He goes, Man, why do you think I love the waves? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, I don't know, like I am on it, I feel like there's this power there, this energy. And I said, well, just so you know, I, I believe that God created this whole world and those waves are telling you about what he's like that he is powerful and you're feeling the power of God through his creation because he's trying to wake you up and help you realize that he made this to show you what he's like so I think that's what's going on there that's why I think you like it because he wants you to be, re be reconnected to him he's like well I don't know if that's the case <laughs> now, here's the thing I give you just a little encouragement on People don't just walk away and forget those statements. They ruminate on them, they think about it, you're planting a seed. And I'm just creating, a, all I was doing is creating categories to talk about Jesus with eventually. And that was part of Romans 1, right? Exchanging the truth of God for a lie. I could come back to that later. Um, so then, time goes on, my wife throws me my 40th birthday party. It's an amazing celebration, a great party, we have a lot of fun. Are you kicking me out? No, he's just sitting there. <laughs> it's time, Jeff. I know it's close. Um, and uh, amazing celebration. I don't have time to give you all the details, but it was a great party. Christians, you need to learn how to throw good parties. Of all the people that should celebrate well, it's us. You know, and your, your party should be a foretaste of the kingdom. Like what Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? A feast, a party. Israel gave a tithe to the party. They're supposed to give a 10% tithe to make the party really good. Christians, when you just go, hey, we're going to have a party, bring a bag of chips. Come on now. I mean, we should be able to go like, look at this, it's a feast. And so my wife threw an amazing birthday party for me. They all made fun of me, wore mullet wigs, because I used to have a mullet. And, <laughs> they, to they roasted me the whole night. And at the end, they toasted me and put me up front. And people in my mission of unity knew this is a time to make Jesus the hero. So they, again, we talk about that. How do we bring Jesus up? So... They raised the glass and said, Jeff, I want to just let you know I've seen you grow in love for people. And clearly that's the evidence that Jesus is changing you to be a more loving man. And one after another, people said stuff like that. Amy, the one who's across the street from us who went to throw the Halloween party, she's really opposed to all that we're talking about. And she raised the glass. She goes, Jeff, you know, I don't believe any of this. <laughs> I'm like, we know. <laughs> and she goes, but if I ever became a Christian, I would want to be like you. And she toasted. She said, I want to toast to that. Uh, at the end, I, I, Clay gets up. He's toward the end. He goes, I don't know what it is, Jeff. Like, I just feel like this energy. <laughs> 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 that's so funny. You're using that language. I'm like, this is ridiculous. It's like, it's like this light in you, this energy in you. I don't know what it is, but I just feel drawn to it. <laughs> Whatever that is, I want to toast it. 
<laughs> and then I said, I said, it's my party, I can preach if I want to, so I'm gonna raise a glass. And I wanna let you know that what Clay just mentioned, that, that energy he feels, that light he experiences in me, that's Jesus Christ. And he is in me. And um, and he, he loves you. And I want to tell you, you can't have as good a party as we just had were it not for Jesus. Because Jesus loves to party. And Jesus loves to bring people together that would never be together and help them learn how to celebrate. Because this kingdom is all about being in a party. And I want to let you know that the greatest gift I could ever have is for you to come to know Jesus' love for you. That he died to forgive you of your sins. That he is coming back to throw the best party there ever was. And he wants you to be a part of that. So I want to toast to Jesus, because he's really the one that this party's all about. And I remember some of my friends raised their glass, they were like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know, am I going to become a Christian about this? Or he, he told her, she's like, I don't believe it, should I have drank or not? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, and so that was a great party, a great celebration. <clears throat> Clay, Clay comes to me later and he, he goes, hey, um, you know where we had that party, that building? You guys meet there once in a while and have a gathering, right? I said, yeah. And, uh, and he said, can I ever come to that? Do I have to like wear special clothes? <laughs> <laughs> There's a little Mormon background there, I think. He's never been to a Mormon church, but I think he thought that something like we have to dress a certain way. And <laughs> so do I have to pay dues to be a part of a club or whatever? And he said, no, you just come. It's, it's, it's kind of like you, did come, you came for the party, you just come for that. And um, all along, he's been helping out with the garden, you know, creating beauty. We would be on vacation together. He's learning how to bless people. He helped pay for some of the bills that Nikki had. And, and he loved us with her, or loved her with us. And, um, <clears throat> so he calls, he doesn't come for quite a while. And he calls me, it's the, it's the week before Easter. He says, I'm thinking about coming to the gathering this week. He doesn't know anything about Easter. I mean, he knows his bunnies and chocolate and all that in our country. But he doesn't know it's connected to the resurrection. So he comes, and I share the gospel, and afterwards I go up to him and say, hey, buddy, how you doing? He's like, I don't know, man. And he looked like he was like a ghost. Literally, he's like... <laughs> and his wife was just in a puddle of tears. You know, she's just crying, and I found out later she just felt like this, that God had been calling them all along to be here. And um, he, was, he was a little overcome, and I was afraid I had lost my friend. I don't know if you guys have ever been in those situations where you finally go for it and like, I don't know, this could be it. He might walk away. And I didn't know what he was, how he was going to respond. He didn't talk to me and I said, do you want me to give you space? He's like, uh, yeah. So I let him go and I said, well, call me if you need anything. So a couple days later he calls me. He says, I believe it. So what do you mean you believe it? He goes, I believe everything that you said Sunday. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe that he rose again. I believe that he forgave me. I said, you know that energy that you always talked about? Did you have it? He goes, yeah, I don't know what that is. But I feel, I feel something. I don't know what it is. It's God's spirit. And he's like, oh, yeah. yeah. He goes, man, I want. Well, what do I do now? Like, how much should I give? <laughs> that was awesome. I'm like, there's no new believer class for this. Thing. You know, like, he doesn't need it. And uh, partly because we were discipling him in the, in the normal stuff of life that he didn't need to be taught how to live the normal stuff of life. He was watching us for a year and a half. And it took a year and a half, what I'm telling you. It was a year and a half of being in his life, eating together, celebrating together, blessing together, living just normal life with gospel intentionality in front of him. So the first thing he asked is, how much should I give? Why? Because he saw us being blessed to be a blessing, and now he believed that he was a part of that. So I gave him a little teaching on giving, and right there in the garden, and he said, I want to I know how to tell people about Jesus like you've been telling me. And I said, well, all you got to do is tell them your story. Tell them what God did. Tell them how he changed you. Tell them what you used to struggle with. Tell them how you realize that energy and light that you were always looking for was Jesus Christ. I mean, tell them what you experienced. You know, that's what you got to do. And he's like, I don't know if I can do that. I said, you will, I promise you. The Spirit of God will help you. And, um, and he said, I don't know, I don't have a Bible. I probably should get one of those. I'm like, yeah, we'll get you one. And, you know, it was all those basics. In the garden, it was really cool. Like, we literally went through all the stuff. Yeah, in about 15, 20 minutes, and they said, well, what do I do next? I said, well, the Bible commands that we baptize you. Because that's your way of saying I have a new identity. I'm a whole new person. I said, but before we do that, I want you to sit down with the, our group, and we'll have a meal, because I want them to ask you questions about what God did in your life. And so they got to be a part of that, our mission of community, over a meal, and he got to express his new faith. And we went down to the ocean, and we baptized him. And that was really cool. Now... Clay, um, shortly after that, and I know we're all, we're time, time's up, um, he, uh, 
he found out that he had a mass in his back um, and they told him that they were going to have to cut it out and likely he would probably sever his spinal cord and never walk again. And so he said, I'm going to go off surfing maybe for the last time. He went down to Southern California to surf. He was out of the beach and there's these people baptizing people. And he told me, this is a really cool pastor I met. His name was Rick. And uh, I said, was it Rick Warren? He goes, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's pretty funny. <laughs> I told him all about my story. And, uh, and what, you know, what, you, how you guys shared Jesus with me. And I got a, a call a couple months later from Rick going, hey, I want to find out what you guys are doing. I was really encouraged by what happened with Clay. So that was really cool. I said, you don't have any idea who you just talked to. That's, he's, he's kind of a big deal in the church. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know. You know it's kind of fun. And um, he comes back and he says, before he's going to go to surgery, it's the night before, he says, would you guys pray over me? Because as far as I've heard from you guys, Jesus heals people. So... Can you pray for that? I said, yeah. So his mom was there, was not a believer. She wanted to see this. She's really freaked out by Christianity. So she kind of went into the kitchen and we started praying. And my, I remember my daughter, my youngest daughter, put her hand on his back and she just started praying for him. It was one of, one of my favorite memories of her. She, it's, it's like she had this faith about, uh, that God could do it. And we pray, I'm sorry, and I'm, such a key moment in her life. And so we prayed over him and he went into surgery and they cut open his back and it was gone. Nothing was there. Yeah. And I mean, I loved it about Clay. He's like, yeah, I knew it. I, knew it. I love that about you, Clay. Now, here's the deal. He really has strong faith, but when he doesn't, he really is a mess. So I, I don't know what that is. I, I found people that have the gift of faith give in to fear really quickly because they either have the fear of the Lord which leads them to take huge steps or they give in to the fear of something else which leads them to be paralyzed. And he kind of goes in and out of that. But... We uh, went in to visit him after the surgery, and the guy next to him, Clay was out, and the guy next to him said, who is this guy? Is he like a pastor or something? He said, no, why? He said, all he's been doing is tell me about Jesus. He said, what did he tell you? And the guy rehearsed the gospel, and he rehearsed Clay's story. And Clay woke up, I said, dude, you're doing it, you He's like, no, I'm not. I go, yeah, you are. He goes, I don't know how. I said, that's God's spirit. He gave you words. You didn't even realize you did it. But you're telling people about Jesus to do this. Now, here, here's what I want you to hear. We, did not, we never took Clay to a discipleship class. He never went to church services. These guys have to go. They told me they're good. They're not mad. <laughs> but, right. yeah, okay. so, you know, what happened was we looked at normal everyday life as the means to make disciples in so that Clay could come to Jesus without ever coming to a church service because he was not going to come. Now, at the same time, please hear... He did come to one service, and all that life that he'd seen started to make sense when the gospel got preached in a public setting. So there is value for it. It's just that if we had done all the other stuff, we hadn't done all the other stuff, he wouldn't know that it changes your whole life. He would have just thought of it as a message for your afterlife. What he got to see was people's lives really changed, and then he heard over and over again how it changes their life. And for some reason, I, I shared the gospel probably 20 times with Clay before he came to our Easter service. For some reason, on that public gathering, that's when God chose to make it clear to him. So there's a beauty in gathering together to celebrate the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Sunday. Don't downplay that. It's okay. But if you don't do any life together, they're not going to know that being a disciple of Jesus affects all of life. They're just going to think it's a Sunday event. So the beauty is... Because we had both, Clay was actually discipled, and he still is. Like I said, he's a mess. But he saw that following Jesus is an all-of-life thing, not just a Sunday thing. So, anyway, there's just an example of how that might work. With a normal person, Clay, you know, nothing remarkable about him, just a regular guy. But he would have never come to faith in Christ had we not engaged in these kinds of normal rhythms with him. I know he wouldn't have. So, anyway. Hope that encourages you. Sorry that I'm losing my voice. That's uh, kind of a struggle. Uh, we're going to do more Q&A tonight. Um, let me encourage you to do this, because I didn't tell you this. Take all the, and then I'll close. Take all the identity statements, like family, missionary, servant, and just kind of walk through a grid. If we were a family, how would we do these things? Eating, listening to God on each other's behalf knowing each other's stories, celebrating anniversaries and birthdays, holidays, blessing each other with what we have, going on vacations, restoring beauty, creating new stuff together. How do we do that? As missionaries, how would we engage that in a culture of people that are, don't know, yet know Jesus? 
And then as servants, how do we give embodiment to what Jesus looks like as we do that? Okay, that, that'll help people think about what it means to be God's people in normal, everyday stuff. That's a part of what we need to help people with. So, um, normally I take about an hour to do that, we about a half hour, so hopefully that's helpful. Okay? All right. Thank you. Yeah.